viewers, welcome to this flood insurance webinar edition of the SCR webinar series. Today is October 15, 2013, and RAP is sponsoring Lisa S. Jones, a flood insurance expert consultant. Her company is Carolina Flood Solutions, LLC. Recently, Lisa Jones presented at the National Association of Realtors Presidential Advisory Group meetings in Washington, D.C. South Carolina Realtor Donna Smith leads this Presidential Advisory Group. Golden Head Realtor Dick Patrick attended this flood insurance PAG, as did SCR CEO Nick Hermitis. Lisa Jones will present even more information at the upcoming South Carolina Flood Insurance Summit on November 20th in Columbia at the Convention Center from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Make your plans to attend now. Her background includes Lisa Jones has chaired the State Flood Plain Managers Association. Lisa Jones was South Carolina's Flood Mitigation Coordinator. Lisa Jones was FEMA's uh, Flood Mitigation Assistant Grant Programs and Project Manager. And finally, a reminder to all realtors to get SCR 233 Flood Insurance Disclosure Form to all your buyer customers and buyer clients and get the buyers to sign it. South Carolina Association of Realtors Form 233 Flood Insurance Disclosure is a way to manage your risk. Trial lawyers have begun to target realtors when buyers are upset. They were not warned of skyrocketing flood insurance rates and want to sue somebody. Don't let it be you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to talk this afternoon about the flood insurance and the upcoming changes to the Bigger Orders uh, NFIP Reform Act of 2012 and what you need to know so that you can keep your clients informed. Okay. The first thing we're going to talk about is where do we get information? If you want to know the sources of flood zone information, we're going to be able to uh, get that information from FEMA's Map Service Center, the address you see on the screen. You may also get it from your local community official, it's typically the building official or the local floodplain manager. You could also obtain that information if the current homeowner has an elevation certificate or current flood insurance policy, you can obtain their declarations page. Flood hazard determination form that was done by a mortgage company would also have that information on it. Or if they have a prior letter of map change, these are all valid sources of flood zone information for a property. The mandatory purchase requirement was uh, done in 1973, and one of the reform acts was passed uh, in that year. Flood insurance is required if those are federally backed mortgage and the structure is located in a special flood hazard area. Notice I said the structure. A lot of times if there's a, a piece of the property uh, that's in the special flood hazard area but the structure itself is out, the lender will require flood insurance at that time. So flood insurance is going to be required to secure the property in a special flood hazard area. The coverage that's going to be required is to cover the amount of the loan. So, for example, if we have a $100,000 house in you know, structure, uh, we only insure the structure, we don't insure property, and they put down $20,000 as a down payment, the lender's only required to obtain flood insurance in the amount of $80,000, which leaves the homeowner uh, underinsured by $20,000. So their equity in the house is not protected. So we always want to make sure that they have uh, loan to value coverage. So in other words, we want to make sure that they're fully covered for the value of the uh, structure, the loan plus any equity they, they have down. Flood insurance is only required in any zone that begins with an A or a V, and it is optional in zones B, C, or X. In zones B, or C, or X, they can get a, a preferred risk policy, which is a very cheap uh, and simple application process. And that's the one you see advertised on television under, with the flood smart commercials that FEMA is running. Are there, we go through this. I think we're going to take questions. You can use your, uh, uh, raise your hand, or we will uh, at the end take the questions, or you can type it in the screen, and uh, Michael will help me with those at the end. So let's talk about our first thing we're going to be talking about. When we talk about pre-firm, structures. We're talking about those structures were built prior to the initial flood insurance rate map for a community. Likewise, when we talk about post-firm, we're talking about those structures that were built after the first flood insurance rate map for a particular community. 
when you hear the word pre-firm or you see the word subsidized, you need to, uh, you'll see the word subsidized. They're changing the terminology right now. They're talking about pre-firm as subsidized structures and post-firm as structures that are considered full risk rate. So there is really a change in terminology occurring right now. So when you see the word subsidized, you want to, you know, initially, you know, start putting in pre-firm in parentheses right beside it until you get used to it. But that's one way you can do it. You can see here the map revised in September 29th, 2010 here on the screen. That tells you that this is a multiple map revision. That's, uh, there was a prior map revision since there was a, uh, it says map revised. Another way you can tell, this is what we have called as a map index, as you can see here on the screen. Do I have a corner here? Yeah. yeah. The bottom of the screen here, you can let me get pointer. Okay. Oh, let's go back. The as you can see here on the screen on the bottom, this uh, screen that has a list of communities. This is on the flood insurance uh, rate map index. And it'll tell you the name of the community, the community number, the panels that that community is located on, and it'll tell you the initial firm date for that community. So it would be November 19, 1980 for Richland County. And that's just one example. Every community in the state is going to be different. And, and when I say community, I mean a county or municipality. They're treated equally under the National Flood Insurance Program. Another place you can find it is through the FEMA's Community Status Book. If you look at the Community Status Book here, you'll see Horry County uh, have highlighted, and you'll see the initial firm date identified was 2-15-1984. That is another place, and if you are having trouble finding this, you may Google, just Google FEMA Community Status Book, and it'll bring up the listing for the entire country, and you can click on the state of South Carolina, and then you can put it in an Excel spreadsheet and search by community and county. What you need to know is that the flood risks are changing. Uh, there's been a, you know, every time we have development, we pave a parking lot, we've got increased runoff, and the maps are going to change. So the flood risks are going to change over time. And the insurance rate maps are going to reflect those changes. When new maps come out, in some instances, there are going to be map revisions that are going to trigger insurance increases. You can no longer re rely on subsidized premiums or subsidized rates for those structures that are built prior to the initial flood insurance rate map, which we're looking about, you know, uh, bigger borders is going to affect about 20% of the properties, uh, policyholders. It's going to be substantial in some cases, and in other cases, it's not going to be so dramatic. When we're looking at building or rebuilding, uh, that's going to help lower your flood insurance risk and you can save money. It's very important that buyers and, and homeowners look at what their return of their is going to be. If they're going to be paying, uh, over time, they're going to be paying uh, increased flood insurance premiums to the tune of, you know, ultimately maybe $20,000, $30,000 a year. It may be wise for them to go ahead now and invest that money into retrofitting or changing their foundation to bring that structure into compliance so that they have, uh, they're saving that money now rather than sending it, spending it later. Flood insurance and making their structure most, less likely to flood. And flood insurance is going to be a primary factor when people are making decisions about buying, selling, and uh, construction and renovations. That's going to be a primary factor. How much is it going to, the flood insurance going to cost me? Those are all things that are coming into the buying process right now. So today's floodplain is not necessarily to tomorrow's floodplains. And this is, you know, when we increase, we put in fill, we do things like that, it changes where the flood water can go. You know, if you're putting in fill, that water's going to be displaced onto somebody else's property or put back into the channel. Uh, taken downstream. So to, this slide basically just says that today's floodplain is not tomorrow's floodplain and that we need to uh, make wise decisions when we're considering how we build at the local level. When you see flood insurance, make, uh, excuse me, flood insurance rate map changes, you're going to see a number of changes can occur uh, when the new maps come out. There could be no change. There could be a zone change going from a uh, low risk 
from you know not having any you know flood hazard area to being low risk B C D or X. You could see a zone change into a high risk category such as an A or B. You can go from an A zone to a B C or X zone. That's possible. Uh, on a map. I've seen that happen here in Richland County. We had about a thousand structures that were taken out of the special flood hazard area, that high risk area that began with an A, and put in a BC or X zone. That does happen because we're getting better information, we're getting better topography, we're using LIDAR data and generating better topo topography to run the uh, flood models with. In coastal zones, they're going to see a new designation. This is called Lenoir Zone. This is an area of limited wave action. And this will be showing up on the maps in coastal A zones. And there are uh, regulations dealing with those coastal A zones that are in the International Building Code uh, for the residential series. You can see a change in the BFB. When I say BFB, I'm talking about the base flood elevation. It could go up or it could go down. And there will be a change in the vertical data. We're shifting from the NGVD of 1929 to the NAVD of 1988. That means absolutely nothing to us, but it does mean something to the surveyors and how they use their vertical controls. There's a the reform also increased the cap. The cap used to be 10%, now it's going to be 20%. That's how much FEMA can raise the rates every year. You're also going to expect insurance to increase on older structures, the structures that were built prior to the initial flood insurance rate map. Non-primary residences or vacation or secondary homes and rentals are going to see rate increases, and those rate increases started in January, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we have the traditional 9 to 10% rate increase that we see every year. First thing I want to define is, you know, primary residence. Primary residence has to be lived in 80% of the time in order for it to qualify under the NFIP. That's a little bit different than, you know, say, uh, tax, you know, for tax purposes. They have somebody will say, well, I live in there, I live in the house. Um, 51% of the year. Well, FEMA's now requiring that you live there 80% or more of the year. So that's going to be approximately 10 months. That's a long time. A lot of people live you know, six or seven months in one location and the remainder of the year in another location. If they're not there for 10 months out of the year, then they are a secondary, this will be a secondary residence for him. That's going to be different. So the primary residence, they have to live in it at least 10 months out of the year. The reform is changing some things, and these are the things that we're going to focus on right now. Over the next four years, we're going to see increases 25% for the cat these categories of structures. Non-primary residences and severe repetitive loss properties and any property where we've had the flood losses have exceeded the value of the property any business or commercial property, any property that's a sustained substantial damage and that's 50% or more of the fair market value, or it's been improved 30% or more of the fair market value. Now that portion has not yet been implemented because the threshold is still at 50%. So I'm not really going to talk about it in terms of the 30%, but when you hear me talk about substantial improvement, we're going to still be talking about the 50% threshold that currently exists in their uh, community's ordinances. And the reason why we're still using the 50% instead of the 30% is because it requires FEMA to go through rulemaking. And rulemaking takes uh, quite a bit of time. They're in rulemaking on endangered species and we're likely to see some of these changes coming out at the end uh, when they finish the rulemaking on endangered species. But for right now, we're talking about the 50% you know, when we're discussing substantial improvement. So these are the cases and the categories where you're going to see the increases 25% a year over the next four years. And these, again, are for pre-firm properties. When you say pre-firm, we're talking about those properties that are subsidized, were built prior to the initial flood insurance rate map for that jurisdiction.
So the preferred subsidies are being phased out right now. We have non-primary uh, non that was implemented in January 1st of this year. And then beginning October 1st this uh, year, we are now phasing out the commercial properties and the severe repetitive loss. These rates are going to increase 25% a year or, until they hit full risk rates. We have rates, you know, structures that are repetitively flooded, known as the severe repetitive loss structures. Those are one to four family. Those are going to increase 25% a year until they hit full risk rate. And these changes have started uh, on October 1 of this year. This is the one that really affects everybody, and this is the one I'm going to spend the most time on. New policies that are is, that are, have to be issued at full risk rate. That's after the sale or purchase of property. When FEMA issued these regulations, and at the direction of Congress, they had to retroactively apply them. So any sale that took place after July 5th, 2013, and prior to or excuse me, on or prior to 930 of this year, they're going to get a letter in the mail when they uh, from their insurance company at renewal saying that they have to have an elevation certificate in order for the insurance company to tell them how much premium they're going to have to pay. So they'll be given 30 days to purchase an elevation certificate from a registered land surveyor or engineer and they will have to submit that to their insurance company for them to be able to tell them the amount of renewal premium they will have to pay. For any sale that took place after uh, October 1, 2013, they will have to submit an elevation certificate before the policy can be written. They will be uh, given the risk rate, full risk rate premium to pay. In some cases, that's quite uh, dramatic if it's gone from an A zone to a V zone where we have coastal properties. Some of those houses were built slab on grade or with crawl spaces and in a V zone we can only have pier post pile or column foundations. The second category that's significant is, is after there's been a lapse of insurance coverage. This is on the deliberate intent of the policyholder where they let the policy lapse. And that's on began on or after uh, October 4th, 2013. So the policy lapsed after 2000, uh, October 4th, 2013, then uh, they will be rated using full risk rates. If the structure's been substantially damaged or substantially improved, and I have here 30%, but currently it's still going to be 50%, of the fair market value, then the structure will, will, will be rated using full risk rates. So let's say we have a hurricane that comes and hits the South Carolina coast. The communities will make those determinations of which structures are substantially damaged. And the insurance companies will be notified of that determination. In that time, the property owner will have to bring their structure into compliance with the current floodplain management requirements or local ordinances and they will be given the opportunity to uh, utilize a uh, premium benefit or benefit that they're paying for out of their policy uh, called increased cost of compliance, which makes $30,000 available for the structure of its home if they are substantially damaged due to flood. If people are looking to make improvements to their home, then they're going to uh, fall in the category of substantial improvement. They hit the 50% threshold uh, compared to fair market value. Now, keep in mind, once we hit substantial damage or substantial improvement, these structures are going to be brought into compliance with local flood plan management regulations, and the insurance will be much cheaper. So we're looking at you know, policies that could end up, you know, they may be paying two or three thousand dollars now, but if they've been substantially improved or substantially damaged, they could be paying as little as four hundred once the structures are modified and brought into compliance with today's regulations. And that's a very important thing to, re, uh, to remember. 
a lot of people don't want to hit that threshold of 50% or 30% because they're afraid. It's actually going to spend a significantly amount, significant amount of money if they're uh, wise and, and get educated before they start their home improvement projects. And for any structure that was uninsured as of July 6, 2012, which is when the Bigger Waters Act was signed, they are going to pay full risk rates. So let's say they waited to buy a policy. Ah, don't really need it. Uh, but, you know, now I think I might need to get one. They're going to pay full risk rates. The other opportunity is going to occur when someone did not have a mortgage and now the structure is being passed down to a family member who decides they need to get, you know, flood insurance coverage or uh, the property is being sold. Anytime you don't have a current policy in place after July, on or after July 6, 2013, there will be a full risk rate premium assigned. The other category that is affected is going to be when a new flood insurance rate map is issued. This is where the grandfather rates are being phased out over a five year period. This is planned to start this phase out. Of beginning in 2014 or early 2015. This is what I refer to as Section 207 of the Bigot Waters Act. Up until now, we've been talking about Section 205 of the Bigot Waters Reform Act. When we talk about map revisions, that's Section 207. There is a big push in Congress not to uh, implement Section 207 as written because it means that those people who did the right thing, who built their house post firm and in compliance with all the floodplain management regulations, that a map change could come along and really increase their premium significantly when they tried to do the right thing to begin with based on the data that was available to them. There's a big push to, uh, to do away with this provision or to soften the blow. And that's what we call grandfathering. And that's, you know, this is step to us and we'll phase out the grandfathering discounts for those structures that built in good faith in compliance. Until it's specifically addressed by FEMA, new and renewal policies are still going to be eligible for pre-firm subsidies. Again, there's only about 20% of the pre-firm structures uh, that are going to be seeing any change to their policy. Grandfathering is still going to be available for those structures that are considered post-firm or built after the flood insurance rate map. And for those pre-firm structures that either don't sell or not a repetitive loss or don't fall into the, one of the triggers that we've talked about, um, they will still get their grandfathering provision. We have an extension to the preferred risk policy eligibility. And we'll talk about what that is in a minute. But when you're looking uh, yeah, pre-firm sale, these are the things I highly recommend. Obtain an elevation certificate up front and have the current policy assigned to the buyer. So the seller's current flood insurance policy should be assigned to the buyer. The documentation transfers, but the rate will not. The premium they pay is not going to transfer, but all the documentation that's there will transfer. So, for example, if they have a current elevation certificate, you don't need to go get one if the policy was written using an elevation certificate. You don't need to go get another elevation certificate. And it just saves your clients some money. They can use older elevation certificates, and we can assign policies. There are some agents out there saying that we cannot assign policies. The policy can be assigned. The rate or the premium that the uh, current policyholder is paying cannot be assigned. To the new buyer, but we can assign policies. An agent licensed in the state of South Carolina can tell the buyer what the estimated premium will be. That's through a quote process. You know, look to see if there are things like openings that would help and lower the premium. If you don't know how to lower your premium, then you should talk to someone like myself or the local floodplain manager who may be able to assist. Not everything you can do uh, is going to affect whether or not the, there is uh, the premium. Some things will, some things won't. 
The agent's going to need a copy of the photographs of the front and rear of the building and one good photograph of a compliant vent and a, you know, a good picture of the foundation. When you go to get your new elevation certificate, if your one's required, then the surveyor will provide that information for you. Coastal Barrier Resource System area is one reason why we want to assign policies. If we have a structure that's located in a COBRA area, flood insurance is only available uh, if there was a policy before a certain date. So we don't want to write a new policy and try to get coverage in a COBRA, a COBRA area uh, because we may not qualify. But if we assign that policy, we're assigning the fact that there was a current policy there. So this is one reason why we want to sign policy. If um, appeals to boundaries are decided by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, not FEMA. So if you disagree with whether or not a structure is located in or out of a COBRA zone, you've got to go to U.S. Fish and Wildlife for that determination. Preferred risk policy, I mentioned a little while ago, preferred risk policy is that peace of mind coverage. It's for structures located in zones B, C, or X. And this is very important because if you have a structure that was located in a B, C, or X zone that is post-firm and the community is in the regular phase of the program, they can get cheap insurance rates until FEMA implements Section 207. So if we're going from a low-risk area, a B, C, or X, into a high risk, anything beginning with an A or V, we can get a preferred risk policy to help them ease into the cost of having to pay for flood insurance. There is a thing called limited loss history eligibility requirements that have to be met, which means they cannot have had uh, either prior claim, multiple prior claim payments or disaster assistance uh, involving flood in the past. So again, this is for structures that were mapped uh, with affected by map revision on or after October 1, 2008. They may be uh, eligible for what we call preferred risk policy extended eligibility. That's very important. And this is just another slide here that kind of shows you what that is. FEMA extended this PRP EE until further notice. And that further notice will come when they start implementing Section 207. And that's if and when they uh, start implementing Section 207. So in the meantime, we want to continue to transfer or sign a policy to the new owner uh, when we have a real estate transaction in play. And for post firm structures, we're going to see the grandfathered rates are still available. There's Bigger Waters does not, Section 205 does not impl, impact post-firm structures at all. When I say post-firm, again, I mean those structures that were built on or after the initial flood insurance rate map for that community. FEMA will tell us when they start implementing Section 207 what the implications will be for structures that are grandfathered that are post-firm. So what you need to know when you do your research for your property, you need to know if the community participates in the National Flood Insurance Program. You need to know if there's a CRS discount. You know, one thing I'm seeing is that when the quotes are coming in, they're not applying the CRS discount. And so one of the things I would ask is why are they not applying the CRS discount and is that property eligible for a CRS discount? There are some properties that are eligible for a 5% discount if they're in a uh, zone B, C, or X, or if they're in a zone uh, A or B and they're pre-firm, they're eligible for a certain discount. But if they're post-firm, uh, you know, I know Hilton Head gets a 20% discount. That's a significant discount. The quotes are not showing those discounts on the policy. And if the structure is being rated as being below the base flood elevation, they're, uh, the discount may or may not apply. So again, ask the agent if the structure qualifies for a CRS discount and what the premium would be if that discount's applied. We want to know the date of construction, whether or not that structure is pre-firm or post-firm. 
So that's something you're going to have to determine. If you can't determine that, you're welcome to contact your local official and ask them to help you figure it out. The structure uh, property is located in the floodway. That's a different area. That that's a portion of the flood hazard area where we have uh, the greatest velocities and greatest depths. That may impact them their ability to expand uh, horizontally on the property. Is it in a coastal barrier resource area or otherwise protected area? That also may affect their ability to expand or uh, gain insurance. And you also want to ask if there are any prior flood claims or flood history on the structure. Sometimes people will have a flood and then go by the policy, so there's no documented flood history for the structure. But you want to know if that structure has ever been flooded before, if it's a repetitive loss structure, or if there is a has been a prior flood claim. FEMA does not publish that information or make that information available uh, because it's covered under the Privacy Act with uh, between the insured and FEMA as the insurance carrier. So there's no database you can go look at to find where severe repetitive loss structures are located. So the bottom line is that some of the subsidies are going away. Structures that don't meet the current requirements could see in dramatic increases in their flood insurance premiums. Structures that meet the requirements that are considered post-firm are still going to see uh, you know, be eligible for grandfathering until the new maps show the higher risk and FEMA starts implementing so Section 207. So you really want to do some homework, spend some time doing some research on the properties, uh, and learn everything you can about the property and the cost of flood insurance. It will come up. There are some tools that communities can uh, use to help save you know, flood insurance premiums. And that's you know, community-wide through the CRS program. If your community is not in CRS, you might want to look into why and if it would be uh, beneficial for your, uh, their property owners to be in there. They get the discount. Look at the insurance. There are optional deductibles. All the quotes I see are coming through with a $1,000 deductible, which is a standard deductible. Premiums can be reduced by using an optional deductible up to $5,000. Now, there is a deductible for building coverage, and there's a separate deductible for contents coverage. So if you do $5,000 on each of those, you could save significantly on the flood insurance premium. The mortgage company, if there is a mortgage on there, would have to agree to uh, the $5,000 deductible. There are FEMA grant programs that are available to support rebuilding and relocating structures or elevating them. And you need to contact your local government in order to see uh, if those funds are available. You cannot go directly to FEMA or uh, directly to the state. Those funds are only available if the local government applies for them on the property owner's behalf. The next thing we know is do they have the right type of NFIP policy and coverage? I'm finding a lot of mistakes. I see a lot of structures that are misrated uh, where they, you know, I have one client uh, who uh, has a declarations page that shows that he has a basement. In actuality, he has a crawl space. And he's been overcharged all these years, and we are looking, uh, you know, he will be getting a refund. So I do see mistakes that are made. And so, you know, I highly recommend that you get a flood insurance checkup or a forensic uh, underwriting analysis to make sure that they are paying the appropriate premium especially on these quotes that are coming uh, in uh, that I've seen. Some of them are exorbitantly high and unwarranted. So you know, if you have come in with a high premium, you want to consider uh, structural modifications. You know, consider elevating above the base flood elevation. Look at residential elevator. You know, their residential elevators are a big deal. That's one big selling point for our aging population here in South Carolina. People want to have an elevator, especially if they live on the coast. They don't want to have to climb those stairs anymore. Uh, residential elevators are automatically submitted for special rating. And it is can be a dramatic increase. There are some simple uh, 
modifications that can be made to the elevator that will lower the pre the elevator shaft that will lower the premium on those structures. Reduce the size of the enclosures in a V zone, V as in velocity, in the coastal areas, if you have an enclosure that's greater than 299 square feet, you'll be paying rates for a slab on grade structure. That is very significant. So we want to reduce the size of those enclosures to 299 square feet or less. That will significantly reduce the premium in some cases. You also want to add openings or in A zones and breakaway walls in V zones. Again, the breakaway walls in a V zone cannot close an area greater than 299 square feet. And in an A zone, we have to have openings. For example, this is a you know, decision, uh, FEMA slide here that they shared with us. This is how you can save money over the years. Elevation will help lower those premiums. So in A zones, where you know, structures that begin with an A, we want to make sure that we have adequate openings. We're required to have one square inch of open space for every square foot of enclosed space with a minimum of two openings on two separate walls. Again, that's two separate walls, minimum of two openings, and one square inch for every square foot of enclosed space. So, for example, if we have a 300 square foot enclosure, we need to have 300 square inches of open space. Now, that's the hole. If I put a vent over it or cover, then it's got to allow for the net open area. And so, if there's any loss, and we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail in just a second, then we need to account for that. I may have to have more openings. We want to ensure that all enclosures are used in, for only parking, storage, and building access, and that they are not finished. If you have more than 20 linear feet of finished wall space in an enclosure, it will be rated as a slab on grade structure. If it's an elevated building and that's enclosure below, and you have 20 you know, square feet, more than 20 square feet of finished wall then they will consider for insurance purposes as habitable space. And they will count that in the rating. Same thing with your garage. An attached garage if you have more than 20 linear feet of finished wall space. So you also want to make sure that machinery and equipment are elevated above the base flood elevation. That includes your duct work and are anchored to resist flotation collapse or lateral movement. That includes, includes gas or liquid storage tanks, propane tanks, heating oil tanks, things like that. Communities have adopted a free board requirement. That is the additional height above the base flood elevation in which a new house or substantial improvement structure must be elevated to. Communities are also uh, optionally have adopted a lower substantial improvement threshold they will be required to adopt the 30% threshold. Uh, FEMA is looking at making those changes at the local level when the community's new maps are issued after they come out of the rulemaking process. But eventually the substantial improvement threshold will be 30% instead of what it is currently at 50%. We talked about the openings. When we don't have proper openings in a structure, this is an example of what happens. The hydrostatic pressure, the water builds against the wall, the wall collapses, causing damage to the foundation. We also have debris blockage that can result. On the elevation certificate, you can see here it provides you the square inches of open area that's, you know, that exists and the square foot. You know, section C2A is the square footage, uh, sorry, A8A, excuse me, is the square footage, and section A8C is the openings that are provided. As you can see, there are not enough openings. They should, section A8C ought to be equal to or greater than A8A. And if it's not, then we need to have more openings installed or a different kind. This is an example of types of openings you'll see. 
The problem with all of these openings is they do not prevent, per, uh, permit the automatic entry and exit of floodwaters. These type vents cannot be closed. They have to be disabled in the open position and not be closed. I've seen examples of uh, vents that have been submitted with an elevation certificate and the picture that shows um, the, the vent is closed and that is not acceptable. There is a smart vent on the market that is uh, certified to provide 200 square inches. A lot of times if you're needing to add square inches of uh, uh, vent, this is the vent you want to use because it's manufactured in Anderson, South Carolina, which I love using a South Carolina product. And smart vents are certified to provide those 200 square inches. The standard ventilation vent is going to provide about 128 square uh, inches, and you can get more bang for your buck using uh, this type of engineered vent. They just have different kinds, different models. Uh, some are insulated. You know, they have the um, just different types of openings. In a V zone, you're, this is where you're going to see the insurance. The higher you go above the base flood elevation, the more benefit you're going to have. You can see the variation here in different types of premiums. So a homeowner that pockets more than thirteen thousand dollars can, you know, that's uh, four feet below the base flood elevation compared to being 10 feet above or two feet above the base flood elevation. So as you can see here, uh, this is you know, quite significant. In V zones, we got to remember you have wave action associated with those structures. So we want to have construction below the base flood elevation. This is not going to impact be impacted by the wave action. So in V-Zones, you're going to see pure post-pile type construction, and underneath it should be free of obstruction. You can have breakaway wall enclosures, uh, provided that they are less than 200, 299 square feet or less, and um, that, they're, you know, that they're used for parking, building access, or limited storage. These are the things that are going to occur uh, in V-Zones that will help you. You want to limit the size of those enclosures again. If you have an elevator, that could cause the premium to be significant. Uh, you can consider an open uh, type cab elevator or you know, use uh, lattice work. You know, the flimsy lattice work you buy at um, Home Depot or Lowe's uh, as a uh, the enclosure for the shaft. If you allow only last work or insect screening below the base flood elevation, that is considered still free of obstruction. You'll get a cheaper rate than you will have if you use breakaway walls. So a couple of things I want to talk to you about. Um, what do you need to communicate your clients about the flood insurance and the flood insurance risk? You're going to need to tell them the rates are going up. And you're also going to need to become educated about how you can help them save money. It's going to be important how you communicate with your clients and what, what you say to them. There are a lot of resources out there. We want to make sure that they're, you know, that they're informed and that you're informed about what you can do to help your clients. I'm available if you need me, if you've got any questions. And this is a, basically your they need to know what path they're going to take to make sure that they are doing the right thing, what the insurance premiums are going to take, what the outcome is going to be, and if there's anything they can do to mitigate or reduce the cost of the flood insurance. There are some structural things that can be done as I've gone over, uh, but you need to double check to make sure that those things will impact the insurance premium because not everything will impact the insurance premium. And this is my contact information. At this time, I'm going to Take questions. How much has been said that this only applies to the second homeowners? Can you speak to that? There are some of the provisions are going to provide provide uh, apply to the second homeowners, but these provisions also apply to any structure that was built prior to the initial flood insurance rate map that is either a uh, being sold where there's a real estate transaction. Is a severe repetitive loss property 
you know, those type structures are going to be impacted. Secondary homes, they're going up 25% a year, but when you sell or if there is a, uh, qualifies a severe repetitive loss structure, they are going to full actuary. Confirm the maximum of flood coverage is 250000 the maximum coverage is $250,000 at this time for building for a single family or one to four family and $100,000 for contents coverage. If a person pays cash, it is my understanding that they do not have to have any flood insurance. What are the alternatives if they do not have flood insurance? If they do not have, if they pay cash, they are not required to have a flood insurance policy. However, I highly recommend that they have some sort of coverage. They can either buy it through FEMA or through the uh, excess lines carriers. There are other people out there in the market who will sell flood policy above the 250 that FEMA uh, has. But again, I strongly encourage everyone to have a flood insurance policy. Uh, they may not want full coverage, but at least they have some protection. Uh, do you know when they're planning on releasing the new flood maps, specifically in Charleston County? My understanding that the new flood maps along the coast of South Carolina will not be released until 2014. Are these changes only on pre farm properties? The changes that are currently being implemented only apply to those structures that are pre firm or subsidized. I have spoken with FEMA this week and it's kind of hard to figure out which ones they are because they don't tell you on the declarations page which ones are subsidized and which ones are not. And as soon as we can get the government back to work, uh, FEMA, one of the changes they want to try and get approved is that beginning in May of next year, the carrier, the insurance companies would be required to put whether or not the structure is subsidized on the declarations page. So any policy that would renew after May of next year, the insured would know if they are subsidized or not. What formula, if any, is in place for rate reductions? The formula for rate reduction is going to be, you know, structure specific. We have a community rating system that's in place. That's community wide. I encourage you to, you know, have your local governments look at what they're doing with CRS. If there's any way that they can increase their CRS discounts or get into the CRS program to begin with. If you need help with this, please call me and I'll be able to help you with your local governments and, and uh, talking to them. However, uh, as far as mitigation, that's going to be a structure by structure case and we will need to you know, look at the characteristics of each structure individually and I am available to help you with that as well. How current must the elevation certificate be? It depends. For structures, there are, you know, we can use older elevation certificates uh, to, to rate a structure. So. It just depends on whether or not it was filled out properly and during you know, the what we call good through date, which is usually within one year after the form expires. There's a one year transition period that surveyors have to use to transition to the new form. So if you look at when the form expires and add 12 months, if it was uh, done within that time frame, uh, when the form was valid or within one year after the form expired, it can typically be accepted provided that the surveyor filled it out properly. Uh, will a primary home with a small rental apartment be considered a commercial property and subject to the 25% rate increase? Yeah, that's a good question and that's going to be you know, depending upon what, you know, how many square feet, you know, what's primary use is, where the rental property is located. Uh, there's so different many, you know, there's a lot of different things that go into that decision making process and that's something we would have to look at on a case by case basis. What is a complaint vent? A complaint, a compliant vent. Compliant vent is going to be where you have a vent that is permits the automatic entry and exit of floodwaters. You have one square inch for every square foot of enclosed space. You have a minimum of two vents on two separate walls. Uh, are the slides going to be available after the presentation? Uh, yes, I'll let you make them available. Okay. Uh, what does uh, the CRS discount stand for? CRS discount stands for uh, you know, it's community rating system. CRS is community rating system. And it's basically along the same lines as you have an ISO fire, uh, rating for your fire departments, uh, for your homeowner's insurance. The same concept applies for CRS. 
if you want to know uh, what discount your community is receiving, uh, that information is available on FEMA's website and you can just Google FEMA CRS and it'll, it'll come up and you'll be able to look at your state. Uh, where are we on the BW requirement for market analysis of affordability before BW is implemented? That's a very good question. Um, there is an affordability component study that has to be done. FEMA is in the process of trying to get that initiated. That has not been done yet. And frankly, that's one of the legs of the stool that needs to be uh, done to support this program before we start implementing Section 207. And so there are a lot of, you know, uh, things that have been considered with affordability, but FEMA has yet to complete or initiate the study. And I think that is a key component uh, in this process. Do they have elevation certificates for C or X? Okay, for zones B, C, or X, elevation certificates are not required. You're only required to do an elevation certificate if you're in a zone, any zone that begins with an A or a V with a base flood elevation. If you're in a zone A or B that does not have an elevation, uh, excuse me, a base flood elevation, then you can fill out the section. It does not require a survey; it just requires a you know, yardstick or tape measure to measure the height above the highest adjacent grade and the lowest adjacent grade next to the structure. But there is a place on the elevation certificate for you to fill that out, or you can have a surveyor fill it out for you. But it's not required unless there's a base flood elevation and the structure is located in a zone A or B, or if it's in a zone A or B without a base flood elevation and it's being rated using full risk rates. You can also optionally use an elevation certificate to rate a structure that's pre-firm if the rate is cheaper for the insured. Well, what about condo buildings? When and how will they be affected? Condo buildings are being affected right now. I mean, they're going through the same process. They're not being separated out. They're either commercial or they're residential. Please speak to the BW impact on villa regimes insurance policies. That's the same thing. I think that you know we're you know you're looking at whether or not it, you know we have a uh, condominium homeowners association in place if it's an RC BAP or uh, which is your residential economy and building association policy or uh, if it doesn't then it's being done as a commercial or you know non-residential structure and it will be affected as well uh, does the state apply for this on behalf of the owner prior to closing or after you're talking about the it's some talking about the grants i'm not sure okay the grants take time and the grant process takes up to about two years for the grant to get approved so there's no quick fix the community would have to apply, the homeowner would have to go meet with the community, the community would have to apply to the state, the state would have to process that application uh, to FEMA. But it is a two-year process, it's not something you can walk in and say, you know, I want to get this done and get a check tomorrow. Is the enclosure limited to living space or simply enclosed space? Enclosures limits below, beneath an elevated building is going to be limited to building access, parking, and limited storage. If it's anything other than that, then it would be counted as a floor and the st structure would be rated as slab on grade. Uh, do the openings have to be a certain height from the ground? Yes, the openings have to be within 12 inches. The bottom of the opening has to be within 12 inches above grade. Uh, have you heard of any lawyers who have devised legal means to avoid the sales increases, uh, such as putting the property into a corporation, LLC, et cetera, and transferring the corporate ownership to avoid flood insurance rate increases? Uh, no, I have not. The only thing you're going to be able to do to avoid the rate increases is uh, prove that the structure is post-firm and not pre-firm. And that's only until Section 207 kicks in. Um, if someone lives in land, uh, why would they need to be concerned about flood insurance? Someone lives inland. Uh, we have flood hazard areas all over the state and uh, all over the country. 
everyone lives in a flood zone, some live in a high risk zone, some live in a low risk zone. And we have maps for every community in the state. Um, let's see. That's a question for them. Okay. Uh, is there a benefit to a homeowner CZO getting insurance before HR 207? Yes, I highly recommend that uh, people who are uh, currently in a flood hazard area buy a, uh, that's in a, begins with a BCRX, buy a preferred risk policy. It's cheap, you can get you know, minimum amount of coverage, uh, they're prescribed fixed limits of coverage, but they're, they're inexpensive and it's well worth it because 26% of our claims occur in those BCRX areas. Um, please discuss more about elevators, what to look uh, for, how to fix. Is it true that an elevator can make the entire house below flood and elevation? Uh, any discussion at national level to moderate that? Um, yes, an elevator can trigger a structure being rated below the base flood elevation. I mean, everything else can be compliant, it can be free of obstruction except for that elevator shaft. And um, my understanding, and anytime you have residential elevator, it's automatically going to be submitted for special rating. If the elevator shaft is constructed of lattice work, the decorative flimsy lattice work that you can buy from your local home improvement store, my understanding that it that will lower your rate significantly. Uh, I am clear on the twenty five percent increase on the pre firm categories listed. On the new purchases, does that apply to all properties or only pre firms slash subsidized? It only applies, the, the full risk rate premium would only apply if there's a transfer or sale of ownership of the property um, for pre firm structures or you know, subsidized structures. The other thing I want to clarify if the, if the transfer is a gift or inheritance, they can retain the pre firm subsidized rates. It's only if it's a sale is it a um, does it lose the subsidy. Um, you mentioned you can transfer the policy to the new owner. Uh, we've been told by insurance companies that they will not do that. FEMA, you know, asked me the other day where the people are getting this information, but FEMA reassured me the other day that we can assign policies to the new owner. We cannot assign the rate. So what's important with that is the documentation, the history of that continuous coverage of that policy transfers to the new owner, and but the rate will not. It can be assigned. If they're telling you it cannot be assigned, find another agent. How do I find out if my community qualifies for CRS? Again, you can ask your local floodplain management official or you can look online at FEMA's website. Uh, is there info uh, from FEMA uh, that we can pass on to the consumers? Yes, there is. And actually, what I'll do is I'm going to, I'll send uh, Nick some information that you guys can post on your website. And I'll also send the list of the CRS communities just to make it easy. Yeah, and there's uh, information on screaltors.org, and where we'll post that information is if you go to screaltors.org slash flood dash insurance. Thank you, Mike. Uh, what do you see, uh, what do you foresee happening to flood insurance after the five years expire? Do you think NFIP will continue? You know, it's kind of hard to say. There's a big movement of foot to privatize flood. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, it's kind of like Social Security. We're never going to get rid of Social Security. I'm not sure that we're ever going to get rid of this program. Kind of hard to predict what's going to happen down the road. This is, you have to understand the National Flood Insurance Program is not a typical insurance program. Typical insurance program is run by a board of directors that looks at the fiduciary responsibilities of the company. And, uh, this insurance company, the National Flood Insurance Program, is run by Congress. So, uh, when it comes, to, I'm, I'm guessing this has to do with under the house. Um, define storage, please. If you have a cedar closet to store clothes in, and the closet has adequate vents, will that be okay? 
Uh, no, we're, you're looking at an enclosed area beneath an elevated building. And that's really storage for limited in connection with the premises. So like your lawnmower, you know, your yard tools, things like that are things that are used to service the property. Grandma's china or, you know, clothing storage and things like that may not be covered under your homeowner's or under your excuse me, flood insurance policy. So you need to double check with your agent about your coverage limitations. Here's an example question of if 112 condo units uh, were already sold and six sell after October 1st, uh, 2013, does the policy increase for all owners? Uh, again, it depends on uh, whether or not the, uh, it's an, what type of policy it is, whether or not it's a residential condominium building association policy, or if it's an individual unit owner policy. Uh, what about historically designated properties in the Charleston area and places like Sullivan's Island? There are no waivers uh, dealing with historic properties. They will be treated just like any other structure. Uh, does flood insurance cover man-made flood events such as uh, water main bursts or dam collapses, or does it just cover torrential rains over flood rivers, hurricanes, etc.? It you know flood covers any uh, uh, flood from a you know. Uh, natural or man-made cause that is covers two or more properties. Uh, we can look at the definition of what a flood is at our next um, event on November 20th. I hope everybody's planning on coming out. You're not going to see the same slide presentation that you're seeing today. You're going to be seeing more along the lines what I've presented to the PAG and some case examples of why structures, you know, why we need to do some things to improve the NFIP before we start implementing uh, any more of the uh, NFIP Reform Act. And we'll go through some case examples of uh, where there's been misrating. And so you'll get some clues of what to look for with your properties that you're listing and selling. And, and a little bit more information about that. Um, that's, we're planning on holding uh, the Flood Summit. It's going to be in Columbia here November 20th. It's going to be a half day event. We'll be sending out emails and um, check out the SCR website uh, for the latest information. Uh, so just stay tuned uh, as we get that out to you guys. And, uh, Mark your calendars because it's going to be November 20th. Is it afternoon? Uh, I think so. Um, yeah. but, but just stay tuned to your emails for the exact information. So we'll be sending out uh, Save the Day here in the next couple of days, sometime later this week. Uh, why do some insurers give higher or lower flood insurance quotes when the rate should be about the same? Uh, why should buyers shop for flood insurance? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we should be giving we should all be giving out the same information but what i have seen and looking at some of these quotes uh, is that garbage in garbage out if the correct information is not given or consistent information is not given to each different carrier then we're going to end up with different quotes so all the exact information has provided to the agent you, know, you have three different agents and i have three different agents who got three different quotes from one write your own company and it's basically the information they provided them was different. And so the information needs to be consistent. And if it's not, then you're going to end up with a different uh, quote. You cannot shop around for flood. Everyone should be paying the same rate. But the quotes, if, they, if we don't have a whole lot of information and the agent's guessing on something, uh, then that's how they can end up with a different rate. But when it goes to underwriting, they should all end up with the same premium amount. Because that we all use the same manual to rate pol to rate policies and assign the premium. Okay, this is the last question. Um, uh, if if uh, when you were saying that uh, insurance policy can be passed on to the uh, next person, um, what would be the purpose of assigning the policy if it still gets repriced? Benefits to yeah, it? the purpose of assigning the policy if it gets repriced is there could be an elevation certificate that was used to rate that policy, and you don't have to. Your client doesn't have to go get a new elevation certificate, or it could be that's in a cobra zone, and we need to show continuous coverage so that there's no lapse. Again, remember we said one of the triggers is if there's a new policy written on or after. You know, in order to prove that there's not a new policy, you either have to have the declarations page from the current policy holder to prove a policy existed. And if you assign the policy, you don't have to worry about any of those headaches. Okay. And um, just a confirmation, uh, it is going to be on November 20th, uh, 1 to 5. 
at the Columbia Convention Center. So stay tuned to your emails for more information. We'll be sending that out uh, later on this week. All right, thank you very much for your time today. I hope you enjoyed it, and please contact me if you have any questions. You can best reach me by uh, email uh, rather than phone, but I do return phone calls and respond to emails. Thank you, and have a nice day. And we'll be posting this on the SCR webinar page. If you go to screaltors.org slash webinar, you view all of our webinars there, and it will be on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash screaltors. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank you.